Perfect. I think we'll get started. Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, and uh, thank you for joining us here today. Uh, my name is Varun Malik. I'm the yeah, Sorry, could I ask everyone to be on mute as well? Thank you. Okay. Um, so, good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, this panel discussion. Uh, my name is Varun Malik. I'm the CEO of a new age consulting firm called Consolidon. Uh, Consolidon is new age in the sense that uh, we haven't taken the traditional model of growing a consulting firm. So rather than hiring a lot of consultants, we partnered with uh, about 300 plus small consulting firms and they become our delivery teams. Um, this model allowed us to grow very quickly in 2018 and 2019. We already had about 500 consultants in our in our ecosystem, we'd already delivered about 200 consulting projects across the GCC region. We now have more than 5,000 consultants to, uh, to select from for uh, you know, the delivery of our consulting projects. Um, Connected Insights is an initiative that we started in 2021, but the background to this goes back to 2020. Uh, you know, 2020 was going to be a really, really great year for everyone, right? Uh, it was the turn of the decade. We were all really looking forward to it. Unfortunately, things, as we all know, did not work out like that. Um, and after the initial shock that we, as of course, like most other organizations had in March, in April, we decided that we're going to spend at least 20% of our time. So all my colleagues at Consolidon, we spend at least 20% of our time on initiatives which help get the economy back on track. For example, last year, we started a project where we got 700 business leaders across the GCC to help micro businesses and small businesses get back on track. Uh, it was called the Superheroes Project. Uh, this year, we decided that perhaps you know it's a good idea. We already have about 300 boutique consulting firms. They're experts in their own fields. Uh, why don't we call them in on webinars and panel discussions to pass on knowledge to um, to uh, people in the GCC and beyond. It doesn't have to be just in the Gulf region. It can be beyond as well and help uh, in our own way to get people back on track. Uh, Connected Insights uh, was the result of that idea, that discussion. It's a seven day summit currently uh, where we're doing about 50 webinars and panel discussions over the next seven days. We're also doing uh, six workshops in the evening. Um, and uh, on the risk of taking too long, but just a couple of quick points. One is please look out in your chat. We're doing a few giveaways. So these workshops are normally paid workshops, about $299 per workshop. Uh, but what we're doing is we're giving away free tickets uh, to these workshops. All you need to do is short, short, uh, fill a short form, which will be in the link. Uh, the link to that form will be in the chat. So complete that and you can, uh, you can attend these workshops for, for, for free. Um, and then we also have, uh, we're inviting people to be speakers in the next edition of Connected Insights. So look out for that link. These will be shared during the panel discussion. Last point before I hand over to my colleague Dinoop is that please stay on mute during the panel discussion. We like to keep webinars interactive, but panel discussions, obviously it's easier if there's one flow of uh, discussion but we'll open up, we'll leave the last eight to 10 minutes for questions. Uh, till then, please feel true, free to have your questions come in on chat or on the Q&A feature of, uh, of Zoom. Uh, and uh, so that's about it from me. I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Over to my uh, colleague, the Managing Partner for People Practices at Consolidon, Dinuk. Thank you, Varun. Um... So good afternoon to all of you joining in from the Middle East. Good morning to all of you joining in from Europe. Welcome to the panel discussion. And I'd like to take a quick minute to introduce each of our panelists. Um, I'm just gonna keep it short and I, and I welcome all the panelists to introduce themselves in greater detail. So I'm just going in the order in which I see them on my screen. So the first I see is Jose. Jose is um, an expert communicator a master in the idea of con con conversing and getting knowledge across. He moved into the e-learning world with Evolve Mind, and that's when the whole idea of e-learning and bringing training to the online world came on board. So uh, welcome, Jose. A quick introduction from, your, uh, from yourself before I move to the other panelists. 
Thanks, Inup, and hi, everyone. Uh, yes, that's right. I'm Jose. I'm the head of communication of, of, of Airborne Mind, which is a Spanish company specialized in uh, the development of e learning platforms. Its mission is to improve training in an easy and effective way. From my position, I'm lucky to be in contact with clients, with the students, uh, with teachers, developers. So I hope I can contribute to this panel with some interesting ideas for you all. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jose. Um, moving on, we have Randula on my screen. That's who I have next. So Randula is actually coming in from the creative field. So, uh, you know, an interesting insight that he would be bringing in. More than 10 years of experience as an academic administrator, he currently assists the academic director of SAE Institute, along with coordinating and facilitating the bachelors of audio production program. So welcome, Randula. A quick introduction from your side too, please. Hi, hi everyone. So yes, my name is Randula De Silva. I've, my main background is in teaching and learning, uh, specifically in creative media. And the, the main purpose of my, uh, my experience so far is educating a different sect of niche market uh, education courses. So in this case being creative media, uh, my speciality being in audio production and from this, I'm really happy to be part of this panel discussion to share my experience and knowledge over the past couple of years, as well as how things have changed in my specific industry. And glad to be part of this panel talk with Jose, Juan, Denis, Ben, everyone else. Thank you so much, Antula. Wonderful to have you on. Board. Yes, please come in. Good morning. How are you? We we then have uh, if all the attendees can have their mic on mute. That will really help. Thank you so much. We then have Juan Lorenz. Um, Juan's expertise is converting these training programs to online programs. And Juan, Juan's experience is across Spain, through Europe, USA, Latin America, Middle East, and he's helped training consultants, training centers, academic schools, universities, and organizations to convert their programs online. So uh, welcome, Juan, and a quick introduction from your side too, please. Um, you're on mute. Yeah. Hello, <laughs> hello, hello, everyone. Uh, this, uh, that's right, I am the sales, uh, my name is Juan Llorenz. I am the sales manager of Evol Campus, an expert in managing of clients who need to develop online training projects. Like you tell, starting with Spain and going through Europe, USA, Latin America, Middle East, etc. Yeah. Wonderful, Juan. Uh, welcome on board. And last but certainly, we certainly have uh, Amir. Uh, Amir, I think your videos. Yep, there we get to see Amir. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, Amir's uh, profile is coming in from a different angle altogether. Um, He's a head of a school, language researcher, teacher trainer with a master's degree in education, more than 17 years of experience in this field. Um, he's worked and delivered lectures in Amsterdam, Dubai, Cairo. He has been featured as a teacher of Dubai by the KHDA, and he has passion for getting technology into education. So welcome, Amir, and a quick introduction, please. Welcome. Thank you so much for the, the quick introduction. Now, uh, it's good afternoon here from Dubai. Depends on where are you in the world. Uh, my name is Amir, I'm the head of school. Uh, I have experience in education for like 17 years. So technically I am the other perspective of the thing. So I'm a teacher trainer. So all of the guys here are like uh, working in the training providers. Uh, I am the one who supposedly received the trainer. So I'm going to give you the other coin, the, the other side of the coin and how things are, are seen from our perspectives as school leaders or, or teachers who were, uh, uh, got like who had to get into this uh, circumstance of uh, teaching online and doing the e-learning thing wonderful wonderful let's get the panel discussion moving forward um now 2020 which of course as warren mentioned was supposed to be the turn for all of us and it turned in a quite unpredictable way um so i'd like to start with with you randula if, if you'd, you'd like to could you kind of share your experience i mean 2020 was when the whole concept of e-learning 
and you know trying to get learning online really took off what was your experience last year how prepared were you well we'll start off with just before the pandemic and from from when i started off uh, we at sae we our curriculum is a trimester based system which means we have three terms in a year and we were right at the middle of our very first term so we had classes that were already halfway complete during the the term and long and behold the pandemic hit and then we had to uh, basically the direction from the KHDA and the ministry of education said that all education facilities have to stop uh and then we have to quarantine for the next foreseeable couple of couple of weeks that through basically a big spanner in the works and then from that point onwards we had pretty much a month of where we didn't have any physical contact with our students we didn't have any um classes because we were still waiting on directives from the ministry and the KHDA and that period of time where we had the one month and the month and a half our i mean head of academics and the senior academic staff had weekly meetings to kind of devise a plan okay what if the situation wouldn't improve how could we move ahead forward in case we had to continue the term completely virtually and this concept was completely brand new to all of us and that month and that month of month and a half of no physical classes or online classes actually helped us to upskill our current teaching methodology and methods so we were grateful that we we were able to have that time in place unlike some i know some other schools and institutions that didn't have that long turnaround to to upskill so so because of that and the nature of our programs being very creative media oriented so it's not like any other program where you would learn uh business administration or finance or accounting or marketing or whatever it may be it's more on you know physically being present on campus using equipment using tools so if you're in the audio course you're in a studio if you're a film student you are using cameras you're using lighting you're going on set if you're an animation student you're working with a computer you're working with teams of other students so that whole dynamic kind of just got flipped completely around 180 degrees and so that month and that month and a half was literally a very testing period of time where none of us had that experience but we had to upskill and figure out how we would uh, go about uh developing the continuation of the already current term so so yeah if it wasn't for that month it would be a completely different story <laughs> and i i can imagine how it was um uh, jose in your experience i mean you deal with a lot of uh, clients and companies through evolve mind um how challenging was it for them and how challenging was it for you i mean you're from the e learning world so mm -hmm. how challenging was it for you to manage this sudden change yeah well it is clear that uh, social distance and teleworking have changed totally the sector a year ago e learning was just an option so all the people who were doing face to face training they didn't want to start an online option because of course they felt it was going to be difficult it was going to take time so they were delaying those options but after the pandemic what happened uh, online became a necessity and the only option so all those people who were delaying they they had to be even uh, more quicker and faster to start their online so it was more difficult so of course for us uh, there has been a huge leap in demand Uh, which means that for uh, you know evil mind we were happy to confirm that uh, we were in the right uh, direction because we were offering a solution that was useful for everyone so that was a good thing on the other hand uh, we have to say that uh, of course e learning is not just for academies for training centers for universities of course they found out a way to to go on with their trainings they found a way to to reach wider audiences in different locations different times but most of our clients are finding in enable mine a solution for the challenges we have companies training their employees they need their new employees we have consultancy training their clients professional associations that are helping their members to 
to improve their skills. So, you know, it's in every industry. So we could say that e-learning is here to stay for everyone, which is a difference. Very, very true. Um, uh, Amir, from an education perspective, I think it would have been extremely challenging to get children to accept it. Uh, was that the experience last year? Well, uh, the experience last year was challenging, but not only for students, also for teachers and parents and administrators. Everybody had this challenge. We were all challenged. Uh, and I said that many times before, we were just in a situation where we are, or we were thrown into the sea and asked to swim, all right? And maybe we didn't know how to swim properly, but we had to learn. So we actually went into an actual experience of learning by doing. Uh, it's like an overnight, we were asked to use online platforms, Microsoft Teams, and then everybody had to learn by him or herself. Uh, that was challenging, but a lot of teachers around the world had the same challenge. We had this specific one in, in UAE, in Dubai. Uh, I think we got instructions almost like Friday and then Sunday we had to start after a long spring break that was extended because of the pandemic. So uh, the whole experience of uh, self, self learning and, and doing things on our own, definitely there was some kind of stress because uh, we had many layers of stress back then. You see, we had the fear of the pandemic, and then we had the quarantine and the morale was down. Everybody's afraid. We are afraid of the uncertain world or the the fear of the unknown, as they call it. On top of that, we had to teach ourselves and we have to get ready for a challenge or more challenges to come in the coming few weeks, because eventually we have to do our job and we have to teach those kids and we have to be up to the standard. The same applies to the students. They were also thrown into this. So we were all trying, it's like, like try and error until we managed after some time to get the gist of the whole thing. Like we understood how to deal with that technology, with that platform. We understood all the features. We had some technical problems at the beginning, but after some time, we started to embrace the change and gradually we started to adapt. But definitely it was very, very challenging to everybody. Very, very true. I mean, I still see this happen with my children when they're trying to get online. It's still challenging. So they come up yes, to me saying, it is, it me? Is. Like, and it yeah. was, and by the way, it was even more challenging for those who happen to be teachers as well as parents at the same time, because they have to stay home, teach the kids online and take care of their own kids learning at the same time through distance learning. So it was very, very complicated, very stressful. I'm sure a lot of a lot of uh, couples uh, got divorced because of that. <laughs> a lot, a lot of social and emotional and family problems. Definitely, everybody was under stress. Was uh, a hell of a time. Very, very hectic. Very stressful. But it seems that we, as humans, we get the best out of ourselves when we are really challenged. And this is what exactly happened. We went out of that. All of us more experienced more resilient and more adaptable and willing to do more and more challenges. So, so true, so true. Um, uh, Juan, um, I would be very interested to hear, I mean, you've worked with so many clients. What kind of experiences have you heard from them? What were the, what were the challenges they faced? Uh, that's a good question, yeah. The pandemic has accelerated the use of the learning. And this means that both the students and any type of training institution or companies are looking for flexible learning and easy to use tools. Whoever doesn't provide flexibility will be less competitive. And as my colleagues Jose said, a learning has gone from being an option to a necessity. Uh, this opens up a new opportunities. And to take advantage of this, many clients are using video conferencing, sending contents by email, etc. But when they see that this is not working, they start to look for a platform that combines different types of options that includes activities, communication between students and teachers, video conferencing, or complete course reports. Many clients call us and say, why didn't they know about us before? 
And that is the learning management system, like a whole campus, where a client can hire and start working on it in a few minutes. That's wonderful. So you've been mm -hmm. able to support a lot of uh, such clients as well. Um, so mm -hmm. you know, taking it off from there, um, probably, you know, Randula, you can help me understand what was the real major barrier? I mean, I understand in, in the conversation that you were having that because, you know, SAE's work is more hands-on, you have to be in the studio or you need to actually have a camera to do, you know, your, your video work. You know, how challenging was it and what did you actually do to get those kind of uh, courses online? If you could share some of your experiences, please. Yeah, so the the beginning phases of the the pandemic the pandemic uh, lockdown period, and when we started going back to to teaching classes, we had to obviously adapt the way that we used to teach. And because students weren't allowed to be on campus and use the facilities and equipment, they would have to dial in through video conferencing software. So the ones that we would be using would either be Google Meets, uh, Zoom. Uh, even WebEx at some period of time, we were also in using that. Uh, so it was, a, it, was a, it was a phase of us testing out different platforms. And based on that, the, the setup of these different classes, because you need to get the students to understand how to use equipment, was very difficult if they were you know, uh, virtually on, you know, at home versus being on campus. So with that, we had to set up multi-cam systems, meaning we had we needed to have uh, multiple cameras within a classroom space to show different areas of pieces of equipment. Uh, we had to move around, have wireless headsets so that we weren't restricted to using the microphone on the computer that we were using. Uh, we had to be mobile, which was very, very important so that we could go to different parts of the classroom, go and you know utilize and use the different equipment. So I think one of the biggest barriers that we faced was making sure that setting up all these different aspects uh, to run a streamlined class was one of the biggest issues. And one thing about a lot of the, the platforms out, uh, out there is it's very difficult to get a multi-camp system set up with a uh, you know, with one of these, uh, with, with one of these streaming softwares or any of these education portals that we might use, without having a third-party application. So what we then decided to use was something called OBS. So OBS was a software where you could stream multiple cameras and you can have multi screens on on set, which was a whole different learning curve that the educational team had to do, but it worked. Uh, and we were able to run courses that way. So it's not about just integrating what you can do within the class, but then using technology around you to see how would it best suit your delivery of specific content to the end user, to the end learner, uh, that to being virtual in our, in our case. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. Um, so Jose, Evolve Mind, I, I believe, actually provides more than just a platform, right? So you, I heard Juan saying that you can integrate everything from the courses to uh, the video conference component, et cetera. What were the major you know, concerns you heard from, uh, from clients? I mean, it could be anybody, the consultants or the educators, when they reached out to you saying, we don't understand this? Is, is that what you get to hear? Well, uh, what we have seen, I think without any doubt is that the biggest fear and the biggest barrier is fear. Fear of not knowing how to start, fear of not being able to do it in time, fear of the technical problems that they can have that maybe they need a developer or a, a support, fear of the price that maybe is going to be more expensive than they expected and is not uh, good for their business model. But uh, you know, at the end, we all know that uh, fears are not real. They don't exist. So uh, that's just a lack of knowledge. And when they have the information, I think it becomes more clearly for them. So what we have seen, and it's curious for us, is that our sales team has become like more guides than sales. So they're like listening to the needs of the clients and they help them to put their ideas in order. So they, they have uh, you know, the way to, to meet their objectives in, in a better way. I uh, think that before uh, the teacher could look in the eye of the student, they just had to know the subject, you know, maybe English, coaching, compliance, whatever. But now they have an intermediary, you know, they have uh, to cross it 
And to do it, they have to learn new things, how to upload videos, how to upload contents, how to share the passwords, uh, how to download the link and to do a video conference. So all those actions, all those new actions that they didn't have to do before, you know, cause headache and therefore dissatisfaction. So, you know, many people could say that online training doesn't work, but what doesn't work is to do it anyway. That's why we see that sometimes uh, clients go for um, the most popular solution, which maybe is uh, more than they need. It's too complex. And others go to, for the basic one and they fall short. So it's always uh, important to clarify before you start and before taking the plunge. Yep, that's, that's, that's so true. And actually fear of trying something new prevents us from doing other things, uh, which therefore, you know, uh, Amir, I'm sure this happens in school as well. Um, until the pandemic, I don't think any of the schools or for that matter, any of the parents would have been accepting of the concept of an e-learning or online learning. I, I believe that would have changed. And But what kind of barriers did you face when you wanted to try and get this across? Well, uh, the idea of e-learning or distance learning or online learning, whatever name you give it, was something very far from reality. I remember uh, I took one, one distance line or online course in 2005 that was from the UK. It was like an online course. It was really, really great. Back then in 2005, I'm talking about 16 or 17 years now, like that wasn't something uh, like known or acknowledged by, by everybody. So when I, when I compare now and then, there's a huge uh, development and improvement that happened in this, in this world, like the awareness of the people the acceptance of the people, all right, from 2005 to 2021. Now, specifically for the points you raise about the parents, again, before the pandemic, in the field of education, people are used to the face-to-face -face interaction. So parents are accustomed to this. They have to send their kids to school. The schools have the teacher. The teacher is explaining the face-to-face -face interaction, the human bond, or rapport, as they call it, is there, right? The teacher, as, as Ms. Jose said, uh, gets to check the understanding of the students. And even if he doesn't check, he feels, he knows that this student still needs more reinforcement or revisit of the certain skill or the certain uh, listen objective. Uh, in the online learning, this one is somehow difficult because we don't have this human face-to-face uh, -face interaction, we lack this. So we have less feelings, less emotions when it comes to, or less uh, human connectivity, as I, as I may call it here, we don't have this part. So this definitely affects the relationship between the teacher and the student, especially if they, if they started from, from, year, from day one of school year, uh, while they are in the online mode, uh, this will definitely be a barrier to teaching and learning because students' mindset are adjusted to the fact that they should see the teacher and they should accept the teacher and create this kind of bond or rapport with the teacher and then learning happens after teaching, all right? But once we don't have this, we have th these technological barriers, things are somehow indefinitely delayed so they take a lot more time to get used to the teacher and to form these bonds with these reports. Now, for the part you raised also about the parents accepting that definitely before the pandemic, you would never, never find any parent, especially in the Middle East, having or giving permission to his kids to go to an online school while they're just at, at home, to attend the classes from home. The idea is absurd useless, ineffective, futile, describe it with, with as many negative words as you can, right? The total or the end result is no way, impossible. I would rather send my kids to school. But after the pandemic, things changed, like transformed drastically from one extreme to the other. Now we have online and now we, guess what? We have the parents pushing hard in many of the schools to get their kids be online and learn online without sending them to school. 
because they are not willing to send their kids to school. They are not able, they are afraid, they are worried, or they just tried uh, e-learning from last year during the pandemic. And it seems it is working for some people or, or some uh, of the parents. So things are changing because of the pandemic. So maybe if we have one, one positive thing about COVID-19 is the transformation and the mind shift and the mindset of so many people around the world in terms of education, in terms of business, and definitely training or consultancy is part and parcel of education, although it's on a different professional level. Yeah, that's that's true. I mean, I, I would never have thought my kid would be sitting in front of my laptop and he's a bit of an expert in Zoom right now. I learned a lot of stuff from him. So yes. yeah, that's that's the aftermath of the pandemic. We all do, we all do. And the point is that you at work has, uh, you have a certain platform and your kid has a platform and the other kid has another platform. That makes you an expert in technology. So now I know a lot of platforms. Guess what? I'm super techno person. Tech savvy, yeah. So, so true, so true. Um, uh, Juan, a uh, quick question on this. Uh, from your board yeah. mind, what kind of support do you, do you give to all your customers and your clients or from anybody from the education side uh, to overcome these kind of challenges? Yeah, I mean, in, in, in my experience with all the uh, types of clients, I see that the main barrier is the lack of knowledge of how a learning works, thinking that it's a difficult technology to manage. The most common, how to create the different types of contents, how to set up the platform, how to enroll the students, how to create course and groups. That is why it's more important that customers have an accessible support department that will go hand in hand with them, helping them and solving, solving their doubts. It's very important in this case uh, to select tools that are easy to use, like a Volcampus, and not to have to take a course to learn how to use these tools. This is why it's better. So uh, on, I'm sorry? kind of following this up here. So in your evolved mind, how yeah. easy is it for someone? I mean, let's say I, I know nothing about uh, e-learning. I know nothing about yeah. uh, how, do you, how do you conduct an online training, uh, but I have a course. So let's say I have a course on communication skills. How easy yeah. is it for me to come online to some, a portal just like yours, let's say, and make because, it e-learning? Yeah, because we, uh, we offer an intuitive platform always looking to facilitate the work of all the users, especially students. For example, we have more than 80,000 active students every day, and we have never had to teach any of them how to use the platform. It's, it's that it's, easy, you think? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Easy and friendly to use, yeah. That's a challenge I face. I mean, uh, Randula, did you face that challenge? I mean, what kind of tools do we use? Uh, like you mentioned, you went with OBS finally and the learning curve required for OBS. I've tried that at one point after half a day, I gave up. I said, no way am I going to do this. Let's keep searching online. So <laughs> what kind of tools are you looking at? More importantly, right tool. What kind of criteria do you put in place? So... In terms of the criteria, what we mainly look for is first a platform that's easy to navigate and use uh, and set up. That's primary. The second one would be the quality of the streaming and the, the video and audio quality, specifically for our field because of the fact that we specialize in professional audio and professional video programs. So in order to demonstrate what we are doing or what we are editing, in our softwares, we need to make sure that the, the student on the other side of the computer is able to uh, hear, is able to see the frames, the, the quality of the audio very clearly. So I think that's one of the biggest, biggest problems that you know, we would face with a lot of platforms because of the, the fact of streaming or the quality of the, the stream from your machine over to the student on the other side. Then the other barrier would be the internet quality of you know, the the, the students on the, the other side. They might not have a fast internet speed where they might not have the, uh, the buffering uh, capabilities of high quality content, which is also another barrier. 
Uh, so like I said in my previous thing, it's, it's, it's all about using third party applications. So to just give you an example of what we use for uh, audio production, there is a software that allows you to play back different audio from different softwares on so let's say you have music on your iTunes player, you have music on your uh, Finder, on your Mac machine, you might want to stream, let's say, audio from YouTube. So you have all these different applications on your computer, but then different platforms won't be able to streamline all of that into one and then dis distribute it outwards because the output of the technology that's connected with the, uh, with the platform would only take, let's say, your default headphones or your microphone output as the audio. So it's very difficult for you to stream all these different types of media out into, uh, you know, uh, to the students. So using, uh, using something called loopback is where you can just streamline all the different audio applications together and then have one common output, which is very, very useful so that you can share different types of audio from different examples from different places virtually and then share it with the students. That's one. Then the second thing is, okay, so how good is the quality of the stream? Because if you are transmitting audio through a video conferencing, you know, you are sending very low quality uh, bit data of audio, which is very close to or lower than uh, a standard MP3 audio stream. So if you want to send really high quality audio, there's another application, which is a web streamer that you need to share a link with the students. Uh, so that they can hear high quality that way. So it's just interconnection of different different applications and softwares. Uh, so that in itself should be a separate course in SA. You know? How to set that, up an ELP? That's definitely you know you know getting educated. Basically, it's all about you know being current with what's happening in the in the field, what other educators are doing, how to get better. Uh, better involved in different practices that different types of uh, departments are, are using and just making sure you're on top of your game. Because one thing that I can say that really impacted the, uh, the engagement of the, the student and the, uh, the lecturer or the facilitator is like what Amir said, the connection, building that bond and that trust. Because if you are sitting in front of a student virtually, if you don't have that interaction or that engagement as you would have face to face, you are going to be losing students within, let's say, the first 15 minutes of your virtual class. So it's all about trying to tap in the best way to engage these students virtually and what tools could you use to support yourself to be able to engage with these students so that they leave the class with understanding the content that you are meant to be sharing with them. So, so true. Very, very well put. Uh, Amir? From a school perspective, education perspective, how did you go about choosing these tools? I believe there are multiple tools being used in your school. And, and what kind of parameters did you kind of look for? All right, for, for schools, we had uh, many choices, right? And, but that, that depends on also uh, the business. For example, some schools have these agreements with Microsoft Teams, let's say, or Microsoft in general. So they have the the right to use all the features, all the programs provided by Microsoft. So uh, in, in many of the schools that I know, uh, they decided to use Microsoft Teams uh, because of all the features that, that, that you have in that program, which will serve the teaching learning process uh, in a more effective way. Uh, here, we, we're also talking about uh, the field. So if we talk about certain training, maybe the software or the program or the platform will be different. If you talk about something practical, uh, like a university course or a consultancy uh, course about the software, again, it depends. So it varies from one place to another. But in general, at schools, uh, in many of the schools actually that I know, they use Microsoft Teams because of the so many features there. They can, uh, of course, give the teaching and the learning, like the session is there, live, the recording option is there, creating exams and assessments is there, automatic correction is there. Uh, besides, it's safe, like, uh, um, uh, what else? Uh, what, what schools are actually looking for is something that is user-friendly. 
right? So when they when they try a certain platform, number one, it has to be user friendly. And I'm not sure about this, but in, in education, for example, we have, uh, we normally divide students into three levels, you know, the level one, level two, level three, uh, low achiever, average achiever, or mid achiever, and then high achiever. So it's like one, two, three, or beginner, intermediate, advanced, you have this categorization in, in whatever field you're talking about. So my suggestion, I'm, I'm not sure actually if that is applicable in some of the training softwares that, that people use around the world, but do we really have to have all of the features, all of the advanced features in one program to be given a training to a certain uh, set of employees? Uh, how about if we just have the basic course or only the intermediate course? Because sometimes when you give the full advanced course to uh, some teachers or some trainees, let's say, they are bombarded with so much information and so many instructions, so many features, and they get lost. Especially when sometimes the, the medium of instruction is English, because maybe this problem is, is mainly in the Middle East, because in the Middle East, we, we, are, we are not English speaking uh, by nature. You see, we, we speak Arabic and then English is there, French in some, in some countries. So English is not the first language or not the native language of all the people here. So again, the comprehension and the understanding of all the people to receive the same training by one trainer through one medium of instruction or the English language, could be somehow problematic for those who are less fluent in English. So these features also can give an idea about uh, training and e-learning in general, how it should be, the criteria, does it have to be intermediate or advanced or only basic is enough for that company training, all right? And also about the language as a medium of instruction. These are some, some of the reflections that I have about, about that, that thing. Right, absolutely. Um, Jose, taking this off, I mean, you probably provide the other perspective. Um, how easy is it for Evolve Mind to actually... Yeah, Jose will take it from here. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> yeah. How easy is it for Evolve Mind to actually provide anybody? I mean, like I said, um, I tried e-learning. I, I looked at a few platforms and just kind of blew my mind and saying the amount of effort it takes for me, how easy is it going to be for the, the students or the, the participants? Um, so could you share your insights from Evolve Mind's perspective? How easy is it as a platform or how easy is it overall in the e-learning space? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, first I, I wanted to, to say that I am totally, uh, I totally agree with Amir when he was saying that not all, every, everyone needs the, the same features, you know, because you can look nowadays, you can have a spaceship, like with a lot of fireworks and bottoms and settings and everything, but you know, of course, who doesn't want that? Gamification, virtual reality, big data, whatever you want. But I think we have to look for the least friction between uh, technology and the user. You know, in, in our case, as Juan said before, we have 80,000 students and none of them had to be taught, which is incredible. You know, I think the, 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 the opposite would be that you have to spend like hours to learn a system. And that's not that what we offer. In Naval Man, we, we, our mission is to improve training in an easy and effective way. So we try to, to put ourselves in the skin of our students, teachers, and everyone to know what they need. So when you choose a platform, uh, we think of uh, different levels. So you have to have first the basics, the basics which are you know, secure, scalable, simple. Then you have to look for a one, a one system that is easy to use, which is really important. And after that, you can think of the next level. Okay, let's go for, you know, uh, gamification, virtual reality, we are, we are, uh, which are of obviously great options. We have to evolve, but we have to think first about the knowledge of the, the common user. So what we are offering is that uh, we say, okay, the, the, the best thing you can do is try. Try yourself every platform you, you, you have in front of you. So they have to give you the, the, the option to use it. And when you I use it, 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 it,
وقتها الناس وقتها الناس ما صبت انا ما اي كان هير يو دي نو so there's some distraction in the background um if everybody else could just be on mute thank you so much yeah jose sorry so yeah uh, you know why why facebook google whatsapp are working that well and are that successful it's easy because it's simple and everyone knows how to use it so that's what we try what we try you know like thinking okay what is the general knowledge of the common user that's what we want we want everyone to go to able mind start using the trial and they see that they can use it from the very first moment so they can start any learning the next day and that that is why we are happy that we confirm during this pandemic that people didn't have time you know to change from one model to the next one and they saw that they could do it it was like wow thank you very much we found at least uh, something that we we know how how it works like you know whatsapp facebook google so general use so easy to use um and like you i think rightly mentioned once i learn it and if it's easy for me to learn and i don't get overwhelmed i like it i continue using it that's how it works yeah and you don't need you know sometimes you think you need a developer or a support team you know behind that is going to help you all the time because you are going to you are going to have technical problems but that's that doesn't happen because it's is cloud based so everything is in the cloud and everything works you just need your password your user and it's going to work you don't need any installation any startup or, so it's it's flexible for for everyone and and secure that's wonderful um juan now if i understand all of these my question is i have a set of uh, let's say i have a set of material where do i start how do i convert that material to an e learning material how do what's the first step for this e-learning slash online project the micro the microphone juan sorry uh, first I totally agree with jose what then and second mira i i have a i first to um i always uh, i believe that that technology doesn't have to be complicated okay because the secret of the success is that it has to be the right one for our needs and be a help not a handicap just if you want to choose correctly first you have to select a tool that is secure stable and scalable so you can grow in number of learners if you need it next it has to easy it has to be easy to use in general and then you can look for specific customers needed like jose tell told uh, jose said gamification big data which are great options but there are people who wants to start creating the best training in the world without having the basis and in the end the learning is not satisfactory make sure that you have the basis first think about your day to day life your teachers your students or your administrators because they will all use it yeah so so true so true um uh, amir um when you got your courses online were you able to do this 100% or where did you start with, with what part of the course could you get online and uh, what part where did you find it really challenging or how did you go about converting it rather Well, uh, working online, we had to, as I mentioned earlier, we had to swift very, very quickly. But the point is that we already had all the PDFs and we had all the information written on websites. So it, it was by sharing some PDFs or some uh, Word documents or some links with with some uh, with the students uh, using YouTube videos also as tutorials. so we had to use this material so instead of relying on the traditional way of teaching like having books and teaching in class using the whiteboard we have this microsoft teams let's say and then you can share your screen you can use it as the board and then you can upload some videos upload some material worksheets to be done and then we can still have this collaborative or cooperative learning like you divide students into groups and then they work into certain tasks and then like everything transformed there so whatever we used to do in the classroom 
uh, now we're using on the virtual classroom. So from physical to virtual here. So almost everything is, is there, even, even when it comes to differentiation, when we speak about, we have different levels of students that should not be given the same thing or the same task. We have the same thing. We give different tasks to different students based on their different levels through the online platform. So technically everything went back from uh, physical to virtual, except for the, the thing that we mentioned is that we have some kind of uh, lack of the human connection between the teacher and the student and also between or among students themselves, you see? Now, I believe that went well for almost all of the courses, but maybe in some subjects like physics, let's say, or chemistry, when students have to visit the lab and do some kind of hands-on uh, experiences, maybe that's not as, as, as reality, definitely, but uh, we didn't have any other option. That was the alternative, and it was a case of emergency, and we had to do it this way. Also, when it comes to some courses like public speaking, let's say, right? Again, the, the, the position of a student facing the audience, face-to-face, -face, live, delivering a speech or working on his public speaking, again, uh, these things are not the same when you give them in, in, a, in a virtual classroom. You can never give comments on the physical or the body language or the facial expressions. It's not the same, definitely not the same. It was plan B for everybody, definitely plan B, an emergency plan that is not as effective as plan A, but it's the best option that we had at that time. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we um, whatever can be done in theory can go probably e-learning, whatever is practical, I guess that still stays hands-on. Yeah, I mean, it requires the physical connect that's required. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Um, Randula, again, that would apply to you as well, I guess. You can only get the theory online. So uh, is that how we went about just getting theory online and then waiting for the opportunity for the students to come in small batches to do the practical? Yes. Uh, but again, in the in that period when we were in the lockdown, it was very, very difficult to get the students in, which meant that students who who didn't complete specific learning outcomes that were required them to have have them sit in the studio, use the equipment, and then demonstrate the use of the, the technology that they are uh, marked on. They had to be given deferred grades, meaning they had to wait until the following term once the campus opens up, that they can come demonstrate those learning outcomes and then we could uh, evaluate them and then give them a grade. Now, one thing that I also wanna kind of continue with what Amir was talking about is the fact that you have different types of learners or differential learners. So one major aspect that I have experienced, and I think even anyone else who is going to try and attempt e-learning is finding out students or working with students that have some form of neuro uh, diversity. What neurodiversity is basically if uh, a learner is probably either on the spectrum, maybe they have autism, maybe they might have uh, ADHD, they might have dyslexia, dysgraphia, uh, dyscalculia, you know, so these different types of students also might have difficulties in learning or engaging online. I think that's one of the biggest hurdles that uh, I think a lot of uh, learning, management, uh, learning management software as well as educators will try to overcome in the next couple of months, years, whatever, so that technology can develop to kind of enhance these types of learners. So understanding the, the neurodiversity of students and then choosing a platform that can support them and support their learning is also one major thing and one major aspect. Uh, I know for a fact that a lot of the students that do enroll in, in our programs they aren't your uh, everyday students because these are students who choose to do a creative field. So they would be graphic designers, they would be audio engineers, they would be filmmakers, you know, so they would have had a career choice to go away from the conventional or, you know, the, the standard uh, uh, bachelor's programs you would find in uh, different types of universities and they would choose a program that's more in the creative arts. So these students have a different way of learning, a different way of absorbing information. So trying to find learning management systems and ways of engaging them, you know, is, is very crucial. So I think that's one aspect that we need to look at. So rather than also, yes, we had the equipment on site, you know, there might be students who are 
not capable of learning tactile wise you know they might be more visual learners or they might be auditory learners so so trying to find systems that can suit your type of uh, audience or your learning group is is very key i i, I agree with you so i mean i i never saw it from that perspective that there are students with different needs and how challenging it could be for them as well. It's, it's definitely a perspective that you know you brought into this conversation. Um, Jose, just taking it from, from Randula there, um, the way I understand e-learning is it, it can be used only for a certain kind of audience or a certain specific kind of courses. And uh, you know, let's say in the last one year, what kind of you know, uses or use cases have you seen the most? Is it used by, more by education? companies, where do you see this used the most? Well, as I said at the beginning, it was incredible, but we have seen every kind of industries. Uh, you know, this last month we have been like uh, reading every customer that we have, and we have, uh, you know, companies, consultancy, uh, associations, professionals, professional associations. Uh, we have hospitals, we have uh, some schools, universities. So I think now everyone is finding in e-learning a solution for their challenges. This is the most uh, because of uh, different companies and industries that are now using e-learning. Um, companies, yeah. consultancies, those maybe are the most common, maybe technological, maybe it's for coaching or for human resources, but a lot of uh, uses you're gonna find. Wonderful. Um, so let's take, I mean, we're coming close to the end of our panel discussion. Let's take a few questions from the audience. Um, any, any questions in particular? I know I think Darlene had a question in terms of how the e-learning works. Um, so Jose, I just want to put it up, uh, up to you. Um, would you consider actually opening up your e-learning platform, EvolveMind, for a, a short trial for all the participants? I mean, maybe it could be a way for them to ex explore and experience it. Is that something you would be happy to offer? Of course. I mean, when we say that uh, the first advice that we would give to the people to start learning is to try everything you have in front of you so you can clarify and you see your needs. So, of course, we always offer a 14-day uh, trial. Uh, for the people who are attending this, so they can try. I mean, but try it yourself, your teacher, your student, and at least, you know, spend like 10 minutes to upload a, a few videos, a content, a PDF, uh, create a course, you know, just a title and, and a text. So you can see that in five minutes you have, you've done it. And you feel really happy when you see that you have created a, a course, at least a, a draft in five minutes and you can start you know, the next day. So yes, of course, they have to do it. Yeah, that's wonderful. So what we'll try and then do is reach out to all of this. So for all of you who joined this panel discussion, we're going to reach out to you on, on email, send you the link um, so that Jose has now allowed us to also offer the uh, 14 days. Is that correct, uh, Jose? Yeah. Is that 14 days? That's two full so you can take 14 day trial um, check it out for yourself if, if all mind is a, a platform that kind of works best for you. Um, I'm sure from what I understand of Juan and uh, Jose's interaction, it should be among the easiest. The best way, like uh, Jose says, is try it out. Just try give it. it yeah. yeah, just to see how it goes. Um, any questions from um, the audience? Any, anything that you'd like us to um, share light on? We have a question from Vandana. So the question from Vandana is, what do you think the status of learning would be post the pandemic new normal when people come back physically to schools and workplaces? Huh? So I think Amir, um, what do you think? Kids going to come back and say, I love you, uh, teachers. I love the school. Yes, they will say that. They will say desperately, we missed you all. All right. And the teachers will say the same thing, but e-learning or online learning will remain the same. It will go hand in hand with traditional or face-to-face -face teaching. Now, after the pandemic, now we know that we can use that and rely on it, either as plan B in case something happens, like an emergency or something, or uh, as a way of reinforcement for the students. So they can go in the morning, 
they attend the face-to-face -face school, and then they go back home, they find more tutorials, more videos, more materials, one way that is so easy and accessible to communicate with the teacher. So they will be involved around the clock with learning, right? And this could be something good, actually. Like they, they, they are physically attending school, right? And virtually doing the same thing at, at home from the comfort of their, of their home. Also, it can serve somehow with some students, you know, uh, we kind of face these cases sometimes. Like we have one student who attends school physically, but then he or she has to leave for some time. Uh, either because of sickness or because of an emergency or family problem. So they have to be at home for maybe four or five days or one week, sometimes more. So in that case, they can shift directly to the virtual class and attend the classes. The point is always not to miss any kind of learning. So the students should be learning all the time. And the instruction time is very, very valuable. So in such cases also, this online learning can definitely be uh, handy and useful. That's cool. So my 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 uh, opinion here is that it's going to to continue no matter what. We're not going back to 100% uh, physical or face-to-face -face teaching. It will be either hybrid, both both uh, modes are used, or the online in case of something happens. And I believe also there was there will be uh, a high demand on the online learning. It will be on the rise in the coming few years. Because now uh, some people can be located maybe in the Middle East, but then they wish to study uh, in the UK. So they can join a school, virtual school in the UK and get a UK degree. You see, this is also one of the things that are being very, very trendy nowadays. Um, Arandula, do you see that happening in the creative side? Maybe SA Institute getting students from outside of Dubai. They don't actually have to travel. Or are we going to go back to physical the, the moment, you know, things go back to its own earlier normal, what we call normal? Uh, I would say it's going to be a blend of the two. And, and that's what we call it, a blended style learning. So it's definitely an integral part where the students have to be on campus using the equipment and tools, because when they do graduate and go into the workforce, you know, they are going to be using these tools. It's not going to be, you know, uh, virtual in those cases, because they would be in production houses, they would be in studios, they would be in you know, these big companies that produce creative media output. But like I said, it's going to be a blend of the two. And one thing that's also changing or how the pandemic has changed the way that educators are now uh, delivering content is the fact that uh, the availability of these uh, learning and uh, manage uh, these learning systems is the fact that you can upload content, you can upload readings, you can upload a lot of content where students can uh, get the information before attending a class. So they have all the material ready and available as long as the instructors or the facilitators have put the information for the students to go back and reflect. You could pre-record your classes and sessions as well. And, you know, they won't miss, uh, you know, any of these information. So one thing that we've seen is that a lot of focus in higher education now is moving away from direct uh, lecturing to more of facilitation sessions where material is already given to the students so they have all the tools they reflect on it they go through it or on their own time or their learning time and the, the actual uh, amount of hours spent face to face with the instructor either virtually or on campus is meant to answer questions or to facilitate any doubts or questions they might have with the content they will provide so you're seeing a shift between the conventional style of teaching and learning into this whole facilitation based uh, approach. So the learning management systems, as long as they're able to provide the, uh, the tools to engage students, even on their own, on their own time, and they give you the ability for the students to meet with the facilitators and answer any doubts and questions is going to be what I feel a new normal might be in the coming future. Uh, being in the creative media field, yes, you can have, you know, you can have it online, but again, there is a limitation. You need to still be uh, able to go through the content and then practice it on the systems available, unless you have a system as such at home to, to practice it, or you go to a facility that has the equipment and then practice what you've learned. 
yeah, that, that's true. I mean, eventually I, I see here some comments as well that, uh, you know, ideally you want to go back to school, you want to go back to your institutions. A lot of people want to go back to their companies. I mean, it's like, wow, you know, you really love your jobs, huh? so you're running back. But that's true. It, it becomes a real challenge after a point. So the blended method is, I guess, what's going to happen moving forward too. Uh, music to the ears of Jose uh, and Juan, I guess, that you know, e-learning e is just going to keep going up the way I see this. Um, but, I, and I agree with Amir and just kind of taking from what Amir said, a year and a half ago, it was probably absurd. You could never get anyone. I mean, I could never get anyone to actually even get on a video call with me, you know, even the thousands of miles. We used to be traveling just to meet people. Now the concept of at least let's do the basic conversations o o over a video call is acceptable. That kind of works very well. Um, yeah, so any last questions? Um, we've had a very interesting discussion. A any last questions um, or comments from the, uh, especially from the attendees? I guess they have had a lot to absorb, um, you know, from the pandemic all the way down to the two. We spoke a lot, I think. We did. <laughs> we spoke educators, a lot. educators, trainers, we, we have a habit of just speaking a, a, a lot. So, you know, at some point they were like, okay, you know, we, we've had a lot of information. So that, I guess that's the advantage of e-learning. They can actually decide when to go on mute and walk away, right? So in, in a face-to-face, -face, they can't actually do that. They're like, oh, no, they know, cannot. <laughs> Back in the seats. That's that's what that's where it all comes down to engagement, making sure that you engage with all your participants in your sessions. Very, very important. Very true, very true. On that note, I'd like to thank all of you for joining in this discussion. Um, I mean, I learned a lot from all of you. I kind of understood a lot of different perspectives when Randula especially talked about the fact that there are different kinds of students um, with different needs and uh, I'm here talking about the fact that, you know, the, the different levels of students as well and how we try and put it across. Juan explaining to us the kind of work he's doing with his clients. And of course, Jose being gracious to offer a 14-day trial. So thank you so much to all of you. Have a great day ahead and we hope to have more meaningful conversations like this in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye bye. Have a nice day, everyone. The microphone, you can have the camera on for the quick photo. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. <laughs> yeah, the photo, the photo. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. quick All right, photo. Okay, yeah. Okay. Quick photo. Um, Elsa, let us know if, you, uh, if you're done. Yeah, if everybody could just turn on their cameras for a second. I've made everybody, everybody can turn on their videos now. Uh, so, Thank this you, is where Anna. we actually get, get the best pose, right? I'll just give everybody two more minutes to switch on their videos and then we'll have the best smile. Ah. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. <laughs> we okay. can vote. All right. One, two, three, and say cheese. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so Thank much. You. Great day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Great day. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.